It's finally happened. I can confidently say I'm ready to switch to a new racket, and I can also confidently say it was a heck of a long journey. Strap in for part two of how to pick a tennis racket. Hey everybody, it's Luca from Rackets and Runners. A few days ago, we released part one of my racket journey, and in it, we discussed how to start the process of switching to a new racket. Go watch that video if you missed it, but in it, we talked about how to come up with a short list of potential frames and how to narrow down that list to a select few. Today, we're gonna finish up the process and finally choose one racket. Before we get into it though, as usual, remember that any of the rackets we mentioned here, you can check out on our website, racketsandrunners.ca, and please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, follow me on Instagram, and let me know down in the comment section what you want me to cover next. But back to the racket switching. Narrowing down the list is simple enough. You can get a really good idea as to how well you gel with the frame by just going out and hitting with it. But if you want to fully switch to a racket, you're going to have to do more than that. Ideally, you want to start this more selective process with no more than three rackets. For those of you that watched my last video, you know that I could only get my list down to four, but as we get into the on-court section here in a second, you'll see that I pretty quickly got it down to three. So you've hit with your rackets, you like how they feel, how are you going to commit to just one? There are three crucial steps you need to follow before making that commitment. For one, you need to spend more time with the rackets. The early process was all about efficiency, quickly narrowing down your list to the ones you feel best with, but now you need to spend a lot more time on court with each individual frame. The more time, the better, because that's how you're going to get to really know the ins and outs of the racket how it responds to different strokes, where it excels, and the certain issues it might have. Now sometimes, issues aren't actually deal breakers. This is where step number two comes in. This is what I call the ironing out the kink step. No racket is perfect, there are pros and cons to each frame, but sometimes, those small issues can be dealt with with some pretty quick and easy customization. Now I'm not saying you should totally change the racket. If you do have unlimited time and access to frames, then go for it, but the reality is, these customizations should be more so there to perfect the racket, rather than totally transform it. Also, side note, if you do customize a demo racket, please uncustomize it before giving it back to the retail store. We don't accidentally want to send out a Pure Drive 107 with a swing weight of 390. Anyways, when I took the rackets out in our previous video, I used them almost exclusively in stock form, got a good idea of the small flaws they had for my game, and started thinking of the little bits of customization I could do to deal with those flaws. I then customized them and took them out for my final playtest. Now, I'll go over what I did to them exactly here in a second when I get into the on-court section, but for the racket I ended up switching to, that little bit of customization is what really pushed it over the edge for me. Now, step number three is probably the most important. You've hit with the racket. You've customized it a little bit if you needed that, but you can't stop there. You have to make sure the racket ticks all the boxes for all the other things that are involved in tennis. Serving, returning, balling, everything you might do a little bit less of when you're just hitting, you have to make sure the racket works for those as well. And yes, the last thing you absolutely need to do is go out and play competitive points. Tennis is a funny game. It's all good and well when the stakes are low and you're just rallying with a buddy, but as soon as missing a shot is the difference between winning a point and losing a game, your body does not respond the same way. There are some rackets out there that I absolutely love hitting with, but as soon as it's time to play points, I just can't seem to figure them out. That's why this step is so important. The frame you end up choosing has to be high pressure situation proof. If it's not, then it's just not the racket for you. All these steps are crucial in switching to a racket. If a racket ticks all those boxes, then congratulations, you have completed your racket journey. Now I am pretty happy to report that I finally finished my personal racket journey. We're going to go back to some on-court footage like we did in the previous video, and I'm just gonna go over what was going on in my head, how I ended up narrowing down my list, and ultimately picking one racket. And yes, I apologize, it's another really long video. All right, so welcome back to the studio. A bit like last time, I'm going to run you through the playing footage, kind of talk about what was going through my mind while I was playing, how I ended up narrowing down the list, just the general process. And yeah, I'm gonna address the elf in the room right away. The racket you see on your screen is the Gravity Pro, and I'm not even gonna make a joke about it, but I know that last time I said the four rackets would be the Arrow, the TF40, the Blade, and the Boom. Um, but I decided to eliminate the arrow for a couple of reasons. The reason I like the arrow is because it almost forces me to hit with more spin than what I naturally would do. And I wanted to do that to add margin to my game. The problem is I think it was too far away from my natural style to the point where 
if I tighten up or I'm not consciously thinking, Luca, you need to hit with more spin, the racket just became a little bit too wild. Anytime I flattened it out, it would just go flying or in the net, anywhere but in basically. So yeah, I, I decided to say no to the arrow and I could have just done three, but I decided to do four because I guess I wasn't ready to rip the bandaid off with the gravity. It's funny, this whole saga reminds me of, and this is totally off topic, but have you guys ever watched The Bachelor or Bachelorette? Anyways, I remember this one season where The Bachelor sent home one of the contestants and then the next day he was like distraught about it or whatever um, and then brought that contestant back. Um, I don't know, for some reason, <laughs> me bringing the Gravity Pro back into the mix kind of reminded me of that, super random. Um, but anyways, I had a lot of fun hitting with it again, but the problems I had before did not magically go away. I know I mentioned customization. I can't customize the gravity because it's already so heavy that I can't really put lead anywhere. I can't put a leather grip on it. There's no way to customize it down, and I don't think I'd want to customize it down because part of what makes it so good is that weight, the stability, just a pro factor of the Gravity Pro. I do want to address one thing that I was seeing a lot of in the comments on the last video. And that is the very logical suggestion from a lot of you that I switch to either the Tour or the MP. And there's a couple reasons why I'm not gonna do that. For one, the Auxetic Tour is not available in Canada. Even if it was, I think some of you know this, but these are my current rackets of choice. That's a Gravity Tour. So even if I could try the Auxetic Gravity Tour, I'm still not sure that I would switch from my 360 Plus Gravity Tours because the biggest thing Auxetic changes is feel, and I've never had a problem with feel with the 360 Plus. That's it. For those of you who are telling me to use the Tour or the MP because the Gravity Pro is too much racket, absolutely logical. In fact, it's the reason why I used the Tour for the last four years is because I tried the Pro, liked it so much, and I had the same problem that I'm having now, ended up going to the Tour, and the MP I just don't play as well with. So that means moving on from the gravity line, ripping the Band-Aid off once and for all. So I decided to dedicate a lot more on-court time to the TF40, and I alluded to this when I made a joke about me being French, and in the back of my mind, I really wanted to switch to this racket. So yeah, gave it a, a real good go, and one thing that really stuck out for me is the feel on the TF40 is excellent. I've always had good feel with Technofiber Rackets. I played with the older version of the T-Fight for quite some time and was really dialed into that frame. But one of the things that's special about this racket is that it's actually foam filled and there aren't many stock retail rackets that are foam filled anymore. I actually can't think of any that we carry. I think the RF might be foam filled. But yeah, I really like the feel of foam filled rackets. Uh, it does dampen vibrations a little bit, but it doesn't really take away from connection to the ball the way some other dampening technologies do, at least not for me. So I was a really big fan of this. I also like the shape of the T-Fight. It actually reminded me quite a bit of the Vocal C10 Pro, if you've seen that racket before. But it's definitely octagonal in the head. But that octagon almost gets a little bit wider at the bottom portion of the head, which just means the sweet spot's a little bit lower, which means you can hit with a bit more margin generally. It takes away from a bit of power and spin, but makes it a little bit more user friendly. And I like that. And actually the bit of customization that I did to the TF40 was to kind of reinforce the size of that sweet spot lower down the paddle. So I added lead at the five and seven o'clock positions. I did about three inches, well, three inches times four. So 12 inches of lead at five and seven. Do be warned, the TF40 has a pretty low stock swing weight. So I thought this was almost necessary. And yeah, that just expanded the sweet spot a little bit, reinforced the fact that it was a little bit lower down the racket head face. And I was really enjoying my time. It's solid, it's stable, it's quite spin friendly because it's a 1619 and it has, again, excellent feel. In my opinion, far better feel than the blade. We'll get into that in a second. That being said, there was something that was just a little bit off still with the TF40. I know I mentioned customization is a good tool for perfecting the racket, but with this one, I found myself just moving the lead tape around the hoop all the time, never feeling 100% dialed in. And that was kind of where I realized, okay, if you're futzing around with it this much, it's probably just not the right racket for you. Oh, I also added a leather grip because this is not a head heavy racket, but the balance is definitely more towards the head. Leather grip helped it big time. Uh, and it's only 305 grams, so it can do with a little boost in the handle as well. 
Um, but yeah, it's just, there was something still a little bit off with the racket. Maybe it's because it's the one I've spent by far the least amount of time on court. Like I said before last week, I'd never played with this racket. Maybe after more time with it, I would be able to dial myself into it a little bit more. But for now, TF40 is not the racket that I'm gonna be switching to. Okay, so the next racket we're going to be taking a look at is the Wilson Blade 981619. You can probably tell the way that I've been making this video is I've already eliminated the last two, so we're kind of into the top two here. And yeah, I mean the blade, to me, really feels like home. I've mentioned it a couple of times now, but I have every blade that's ever come out, so I just really like this racket. There's something about the blade where it is a true, true player's racket, uh, but it still feels quicker. It accelerates through the air a little bit faster than what you would expect from a traditional player's racket. I think this is part of the reason why it's such a popular racket amongst juniors, pros, and modern players is that it, it does have an element of modernity, I guess, that a lot of player's rackets don't. Um, and this blade in particular, the thing that always stands out every time I go out and hit with it is just how easy it is to use. That 45 braid technology they use basically makes it so that the sweet spot is bigger, the racket's more stable, but it still has a pretty low manageable swing weight which also means you can swing the racket quicker through the air. So yeah, definitely one of the most user-friendly blades ever. The one problem that I have with this 45 braid and that I have with some other Wilson rackets is that it makes it feel a little bit mushy and a little bit muted. This is why I said I prefer the feel of the TF40. Now it's funny because I do put a pretty heavy emphasis on the feel that I have with a racket when I'm determining how much I like it, but the problem that I do when I do that is that I kind of mix up feel for the ball and the dialed inness that I have for the racket. So a lot of you in the last video mentioned, why aren't there any Yonix rackets on this list? And the reason there are no Yonix rackets is that I haven't been the biggest fan of vibration dampening mesh ever since they introduced it into their frames. That being said, Every time I play with an E-Zone, I play really, really well. So maybe not including an E-Zone in this racket journey was a mistake because objectively speaking, I do really like the way I play with E-Zone and it's another racket that does really well with a bit of customization for me. In fact, I took it out customized on the last day of my play test because I read all the suggestions on the YouTube comments and I was like, yeah, I should probably try the E-Zone. And there might be a bit of regret there, but I did, just didn't have enough time to give it a full on go. Who knows, maybe down the line, I will switch to the E-Zone one day, but that's not gonna be today. Anyways, back to the blade. Now, the blade is in the top two rackets, so I played a lot with the blade. And that low swing weight, I really liked a lot of the time, but I did still find the stability to be a little bit lacking when I was hitting against really big hitters. The racket got pushed around a little bit, but that was okay because like I said, playing more with the racket is where you're going to expose some of the flaws. And that was a small flaw, but a flaw that can be corrected. And I added about four inches, again, four times four, so 16 inches of lead at three and nine to stabilize it against more pace. And that helped big time. So I took the blade to the next step and I had a buddy who had a match the next day when I was hitting with him and he really needed to practice his serves. So I was like, okay, this is perfect. I'm going to practice some returns with the blade. Now that it's customized to be more stable, this could actually be really good. And I was hitting returns with it and I was actually doing really well with that bit of customization. And the beauty of all that was that the swing weight still wasn't even that high. So I was swinging it pretty quickly through the air, still getting plenty of spin. So the blade is definitely in the top two for potential racket switches. But before we determine that, let's move on to the boom. All right, now let's talk about the boom because honestly, until I did the head rackets overview video a couple weeks ago, I'd kind of forgotten about this racket. I'm not going to lie. It doesn't get talked about much and that's understandable for a couple reasons. For one, I think the marketing behind this racket was awful. Um, Another thing is, and I kind of disagree here, but some people don't like the look of the boom. I love the turquoise look. I think the head logo in the top of the hoop looks a little cheap, but other than that, I like the look. But anyways, I hit with it two weeks ago and I was very pleasantly surprised during that head rackets overview. I was hitting really well with it even then. So I was like, okay, 
this is pretty cool. This is obviously making it to the next step and I wanna do some work to this racket, see, what, see what's up. And I added a leather grip. Obviously I put my turn of grip on it as well. And when I added that leather grip, the stability that came with it, with that little bit of extra weight was incredible. Now don't get me wrong, this is not an unstable racket stock, but those, what, five to seven grams that a leather grip add made it really, really quite good. Now, one thing I wanna mention right away is that I love the feel and connectedness that I have to the ball on this racket. And that kind of makes sense because of what I said last week about trying to narrow down your list based off of what has worked for you in the past. Now, as you guys saw earlier, the racket I was using before this racket switch was the Graphene 360 Plus Gravity Tour. And while it might not seem too similar to the boom on paper, it actually has the same beam thickness, very similar technology minus the auxetic, and similar stiffness. So in terms of feel, they're actually kind of similar in some ways. So it makes sense that I was really connected to the ball with the boom. But it wasn't just the feel that I like with the boom. This racket has an incredible level of power, spin, stability, and a very big sweet spot for how good it feels. Now, I think a lot of that comes down to this unique shape, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about this shape because it's very similar to the V-Core, and the V-Core is an excellent racket, but basically, the V-Core and the Boom are a little bit more squared off at the top portion of the head, which moves the sweet spot farther up the head. And what having a higher sweet spot does is it helps give the racket a bit more of everything. So more power and more spin. But I don't find the sweet spot to be all that punishing lower down the frame. That adds an element of margin to your play where when you're not feeling like you want to go for big, heavy shots as much, you can kind of tighten yourself up, make contact a little bit lower down that sweet spot, slow the point down, hit with more spin, hit with more margin, and the fact that it doesn't punish you when you do that is really impressive. Oh, and one other thing I want to mention is that the boom almost feels like it's longer than 27 inches, if that makes sense, or at least it has more leverage over the ball than a 27 inch racket, which actually does make sense because the sweet spot is higher up the frame. So that in practice would make it feel longer, I guess. And I really, really like this, especially on my backhand wing. The problem is every time I've tried an actual extended racket, I've ended up hating it on my forehand wing because it just feels too clunky. I can't snap my wrist through the forehand well enough. That wasn't a problem with me on the forehand with the boom. I was still swinging it really quickly through contact, but it just reinforced the fact that the boom is a racket that is extremely complementary to my game. I started thinking this could be the racket I'm gonna switch to. And I was like, okay, I need to serve, I need to return and I need to play some points to really finalize this. So I started serving. And this was cool because I'm not a big server, so take this with a pinch of salt, but I was serving bombs with the boom, at least bombs relative to my game. And I was thinking, okay, if I can serve bigger with this racket and it's the racket that I feel most comfortable with from the baseline, well, this is really good. And I knew in the back of my mind, as soon as I started returning with it, it was gonna be great because the stability was so good. And sure enough, I started returning and it was holding up extremely well. And then I started playing points and yeah, you'll see, you know, tightened up a little bit playing points, but serving, returning, and even in the rally, I just felt so connected to the ball. And whenever I did miss, I didn't have this feeling in the back of my head that it was the boom's fault, which is such a good feeling to have because when you're playing with a new racket every week, don't get me wrong, it's great and all that, but it's pretty easy to tell yourself, okay, I missed that shot because I don't like this racket and I'm not used to it, but I wasn't getting that feeling at all with the boom. Every time I missed, I was like, nah, that was, that was you, Luca. And after all that time, I couldn't find a flaw with the racket. And so I think my racket journey is over. I'm switching to the Head Boom Pro. Now this is funny because if for whatever reason there had been live betting odds on me switching to a racket two weeks ago, the Head Boom Pro Betting on that would have made you a millionaire because it was so far off my radar 
I hadn't thought of this racket in probably a year. And now I'm switching to it, which is really cool. I think it gives me more variety than my Gravity Tour did. My Gravity Tour was always incredibly solid. I felt like I could really just take big cuts of the ball and always feel confident. I feel that way about the boom, but I also feel like it just gives me a little bit more spin and power, top end spin and power potential than the Gravity Tour does. And that's why I'm pretty confident in this decision. And yeah, really excited to start playing a little bit more with it. So there you go. I switched to the Boom Pro, which I bet not many of you were expecting, myself included. More importantly though, I hope the whole process I just described in excruciating detail can help you figure out how to take on a racket switch. I know it can be a bit of a daunting task, but if you come up with a method and stick to it, I'm sure you'll get there in the end. I did just want to emphasize though that the most important thing when you're looking to switch to a racket is confidence. You can see a lot of what went through my mind while I was demoing the frames was, oh, well, I really like this part of the racket or I like the spin, I like the feel, but in the end, the most important thing to feel is 100% confidence in your racket, and that's really what pushed the Boom Pro over the edge for me. With that said, it is high time for me to end this video, and with it, the Racket Journey series. Hopefully you enjoyed this more behind the scenes type content. I know it's a little bit different to what we've done in the past, but I really like doing it. Let me know in the comments what you thought. But for now, that is going to be it from us today. Thank you so much for watching. Remember that if you do want to demo any of these rackets, you can come visit us in store or check them out online at racketsandrunners.ca.